Good morning. If you're at the, we'd like to welcome you to the New Parish Church of the Brethren on this fine rainy day morning since we needed the rain. It's very beautiful outside. Our, as I look around, I don't see any guests. Did I miss anybody except Ben Godfrey that's sitting up front? He's not really a guest, but came the farthest. Did I miss anybody out there? If not, the announcements are as follows. Tuesday, there will be commission meetings, so check your bulletin for the time of your commission meeting. And Wednesday, the youth will meet at 6 o'clock. And that's all the announcements that are here. If you have any, if there, check your bulletin if you'd like to look at some more announcements. And we will continue worshiping as we listen to the music. Join me in singing on page 10, Brethren, we have met to worship.
As the children remain seated, I'd like to invite Teresa or for the children's message. Well, children, can you see this picture? This is a picture of an insect that God created to be exceedingly wise. Now, what is this? What is it? An ant. An ant, God says, is exceedingly wise. In, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verses 24 and 25, there are four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. Again, in Proverbs 6.6, 6, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Now, have you ever seen an ant on a sidewalk? Sure we have. Have you ever seen an ant in your house? Now, is an ant very big? No, an ant is very tiny. How big must their brain be? It's got to be even tinier, right? And yet God says they are wise with their tiny, tiny brains. Now let's consider, how are they wise? There are at least 16 different types of ants in many colors, yellow, red, brown, and black. And all of them live in colonies. That is their home. Now within their home, within their colony, there is a division of labor. There is communication between the individual ants and they have an ability to solve complex problems. In the colony, each ant has a job to do. Now, up at the top, top notch ant is called the queen. She lays the eggs. And then there are the worker ants, the wingless females. They gather food, they feed the larvae. That means these wingless females feed the little ones. They maintain the nest and they defend the colony. That's a lot of work, isn't it? And then there are the male ants. They have wings, they're a special friend to the queen, and then they die young. Now, how long does an ant live? A worker ant can live seven years, unless I stamp on it. <laughs> queen ants can live 15 years. Now, what problems do the ants solve with their tiny, tiny brains? Well, food and water must be secured for these large colonies. A colony can number as high as 300,000 to 500,000 ants. Now, how many brothers and sisters do you have in your home? Just a couple, right? Imagine that you had thousands of brothers and sisters, and you had to get enough food and water for everybody in your colony. How do they find that much food? If a worker ant finds a food source, crumbs, maybe you dropped a crumb on your toast, or at your picnic and there's a couple of crumbs on your blanket, a worker ant comes, he says, oh, I have found food. And immediately he leaves off a chemical scent. Now, the ant does not stay there and chew the food. He takes that bit of food, leaves the chemical scent, comes back to the nest so that other ants can follow him. He says, I found food, come with me. When food is brought to the nest colony, it is fed to the oldest ants first. If the colony is threatened, the entire colony can move to a new location as a group. Can you imagine moving your 300,000 brothers and sisters to a new home, all as a group? It is estimated that ants make up 25%, up to 25% of all the land creatures. We're talking cats, dogs, people, insects, of all the land creatures that walk on the earth, 25% of them are ants. 
So what can we learn from the ants that God calls exceedingly wise? God praises them. They give us lessons in wise living so that we may have plenty and enjoy life. They work hard. They work together. They gather their food in the summer. They communicate. They work for the good of the entire colony. Now, who taught the ants to be so wise? Did they go to school? No. God placed within each tiny ant brain these abilities. What a great God we serve. If God cares enough to provide an organized home, a means to get food for each tiny ant, how much more does he care for us? Let your hearts be at peace. Work hard and gather your food. <laughs> for that message and we'll stand again as we sing another hymn. Please join me in singing on page 556, Gentle Shepherd, and we'll sing it through twice. someone to help us find our way, don't we? And uh, praise God, we have the Lord Jesus Christ to follow and his word to read, to discern the Holy Spirit living within us to help us understand uh, God's word and put it into action. And that is, that is a pretty cool thing, I think. So how are you, church? Blessed you made it through another week of 2020, what do you think? <laughs> Amen. You are blessed by the best indeed. Actually, this was a great week for me. I got to spend a, a fair amount of time the last two weeks, actually. Um, I, before Ben got here, Sam and I spent a lot of time together. And then uh, Dan and I spent a good day together. And then uh, Ben, we've been uh, working on muddy. Now, I am a master of disaster, and he's seeing that. They're all the boys are all seeing that, and I don't know. They said something about 
that we have sons, and I said, I need every one of them. And I said, without them, I would be lost. Uh, so I don't, I'm not ready to mud yet or to frame out uh, or to do put dampers in pipes. Uh, but boy, it's pretty cool to watch them all do their thing. And in our house, it's funny, kind of our, our new house, we can say it's ours now. We, uh, it's official as of Friday a week ago. Every time I come in, I think it looks like a war zone. <laughs> and I, I kid the boys, since we're close to Dan, they come up sometimes. Uh, and uh, Silas and Declan, and I say, what'd you do to our house? <laughs> and they just look around and think, what's the matter with him? <laughs> so anyhow, I just wanted to share, you know, 2020's been good in that way. Uh, it was good for me. I hope you're getting some moments that you can say, hey, uh, this is all right. Um, want to, uh, certainly on a much more serious note, remember the Lambright Troyer families and their loss of Marion. Apparently he was known uh, very well in the area and was uh, known very well by the fair board and 4-H. Uh, the funeral service was yesterday and Marion is Ashley's grandfather. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but it looks like you can get involved on auctions on uh, online. They're doing it some way that you can bid from your computer. So you might check that out because I know the Lambrights have some uh, cattle for sale and uh, I don't think you actually get the critter but uh, it helps the kids recoup some of the cost of raising the animal. Um, my uh, brother-in-law, Jim, he has good days and bad days, and my sister drives her crazy kind of, one day he won't eat or anything or even respond to her, next day he gets out of bed and does exercises. So he's just in that stage where, you know, you just don't know, and of course he's under, uh, care under hospice care, so we know that usually means they think about six months to live. And I think I think my sister's okay with that as she thinks through that. Uh, not certainly not wanting it, but but understanding that's probably the way that's going to go. So your prayer, continue prayers there are good. Pray for Marvin. Marvin is having trouble with his one eye, especially. Uh, if I saw right, it's like looking down and looking to the right and he can't control it. And he's had some eye doctors already, they've not come up with it. Connie said that it might mean surgery. So, if, you know, if Mark, he always has a smile on his face and a, and a good story to tell. So just remember he's going through that. Bob's sister, Pat, who lives in Alabama, was tested for COVID, but she hasn't received the results. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. of living outside of time, which is where you live. You've always been, you always will be, you always are. And, and that's something, you know, we, we get things and buy things or build things, and uh, we know there's a beginning and there's a time when it's most useful, and then there's an end. Uh, seems buildings closer, they're not old at all anymore when it gets the end of it. So we just, you know, we don't grasp that concept, but we're glad that we have a God that knows what is happening, that his plan A doesn't have to come to a T and say, I wonder which way I should go here, uh, and then come to another T and not know, you know, everything before anything was created, it was all laid out. That's another thing that it's hard for us to understand, and you know why we believe it? We believe it by faith. And we're glad, Lord, that, that you tell us about that. Lord, we're, we're glad that we can worship, and we're glad that we can come, uh, some of us physically, to uh, this church building and worship, others worshiping uh, by listening on an uh, electronic device, uh, whatever they're using. And, and we're glad for the extended reach that that gives us as a church. But Lord, we continue to pray that, that each week you will send 
more and more people uh, back until it gets a little more uh, normal. And I don't know what normal is anymore, uh, but you know, we just we just ask that we make wise decisions, Lord, that we do uh, what we're told that we should do as much as we can, and and then that we just trust you with the rest. And, and that's an important component that we don't want to lose, trust in you. We want to have, have faith enough to understand and believe that you can care for us. Uh, so we, we are glad for the opportunity. Lord, I want to just take time to thank you for music, the beautiful music that's been played and sung this morning. Uh, wow, is it pleasing to the ear. And I'm not sure how that all works, but you know, it's, there's some music that if it's not played well or on purpose, um, it can be played that it's like makes you draw up almost. But what what beautiful music. And the only thing that's drawing me to today is you. And I thank you for that. Lord, we uh, pray for uh, Marion and the Lambright and Troyer families. And, and we just uh, pray for uh, Ashley as she lost a, a grandfather and her children who lost a great grandfather. And just uh, be with the family as they go through this time. Lord, uh, we just pray for my, my brother-in-law, Jim, and we pray for Marvin, and we pray for that. And you know everything that's going on there, Lord, and we just give those situations to you and ask you to move in mighty ways. We would like to see good results, Lord, out of, out of all these, uh, these individuals. And we know... Again, it's hard to understand, but your will will be done, and what your will is, is always better than ours. Now, that's where we think, I don't know about that, but again, by faith, we accept that. Lord, we thank you for um, those who are serving uh, on maybe on foreign soil, maybe on American soil, but as uh, that can be very dangerous, we ask you to be with them. For those uh, serving in the with the police, um, as I think I saw another a policeman was lost. That one, I'm not sure if it was a shooting, but got hit by a car, and, and there might have been uh, other other police that lost their lives. And, and it's getting harder and harder to find police. Um, and um, you know, some people, I'm afraid, are going to find out what it means if they don't have police. And I'm not sure they're really ready for that. Uh, so we pray for that situation, which carries us right into the whole government situation with elections and everything. And Lord, help us be wise about how we talk about um, the candidates and, and help us open our ears and, uh, you know, to, to look at the choices and think through what these choices make. You know, someone, sometimes people say, hey, change, just, just change is good. Just change it. Not always. Not always. Try to follow through and, and look now what does this mean if we go this way if we go that way so we pray that we would that you would give us wisdom lord and that we would somehow even if it's candidates that we don't care for that we would certainly not hate them and we'd certainly pray for them and and uh we wouldn't want to see god work through them if they would be so willing uh, for our church lord we, we pray for it and we know that uh, this week was, um, you know, a big, big blow uh, with con losing congregations and things. And, um, but, but again, it doesn't seem like the leadership understands or cares what people are upset about. And, well, you know, it boils down to the Bible. We want to follow the Bible. I, I guess others would say they're following the Bible too, but it's a different Bible somehow. It's not the same one and the same. You think when we say Jesus, we're all talking about the same Jesus, but we're not. Or when we say God, we're talking about the same God, we're not. People have made idols of God and Jesus, making them the way they would like him to be. So that's a that's a whole, whole other, uh, you know, can of worms or whatever you want to call it. And, but we do want to take time to lift up our church leaders. And I know that we probably have unspoken requests. Here is this sonically with those to you. Lord, I know that, that parenting can bring its ups and downs, uh, its joys and sorrows. But Lord, 
Nancy and I have really been blessed and fortunate um, to have the boys that we have, the sons that we have, the families. And Lord, we would uh, ask that other people would would know what what we know, or even better. Uh, I'm not saying ours is the best relationship in the world, but that that uh, they could experience family times and, and the feeling of being a whole family. That, that's tough in these days and times. And we want to give you thanks for that. We want to give you thanks for who you are, God, for what you do, the things that we think about and the things that we don't. Lord, just be with Brother Len as he comes today, and as he's prepared a message from your word. Um, and we just pray, Lord, that, that you move him and use him in a mighty way. And that some of the things that he says and challenges us with, that we don't just say, oh, that was a good chasm, and let it go. That we take it home and, and roll around in our minds. Uh, instead of having a roast preacher, we, have, uh, we end up having roast lesson uh, or Bible lesson. And uh, that we could have good talks with our families and, and about what we hear today. Lord, uh, just use Brother Glenn as you choose. And we thank you for him and his faithfulness and the help that he provides me. Lord, we just uh, thank you and praise you for everything that's already happened and for all that's going to happen in the blessed and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Wow. <laughs> if, if I look different, uh, Pastor Stan and I have been given permission when we preach to take the mask off. So I brush the short, put my mask back on after the message is finished. I'm going to just reread uh, one of the verses that Jeanette read. I'm going to read from the King James Version in Luke 8, verse 21. And he answered and said unto them, my mother and my brethren are those which hear the word of God and do it. We know the word brethren is sort of a little ancient word. In the contemporary English, we often say the word brothers. Some of you know I have a library at home with a lot of reference books, and one of the reference books that I have is called Anabaptists USA. And if you turn to that book, you go to the state of Indiana, you'll find there are several different denominations in our state of Indiana that use the word brother. The Brethren Church headquartered in Ashland, Ohio has 34 congregations. The Brethren in Christ Church, four. The Church of the Brethren, 96. There's a group called Conservative Grace Brethren with five. And in the whole state of Indiana, there are only two Dunkard Brethren congregations, and one of them is on Green Road in, in Goshen. You've probably been past that. Grace Brethren churches have 18. The Old Brethren have two. And I don't know if you've run into any Old Brethren recently, but in June when I had my hernia surgery, my nurse sort of had on plain dress, and I asked her, I said, well, would you be a German Baptist? And she said, no, I'm an Old Brethren. Well, there are two Old Brethren congregations in the state of Indiana. And then there's a group called Old German Baptist Brethren. Or no, they call themselves Old Brethren German Baptists. We've got to get the word straight here. They have one congregation. 
And then there are the old German Baptist brethren in Indiana with nine congregations. But I go back to the question, who are the authentic brethren in Indiana? We know that many denominations and congregations have chosen to identify themselves over the years as brethren, and certainly geography and chronology have separated them. I'd like us to travel back in time for a moment to Central Europe, to a place called Moravia back in 1528. There's a group of people organized by Jacob Putter who called themselves Hutterian Brethren. You can travel from Moravia in Europe to Pennsylvania, Lancaster County in 1778. That witnessed the beginning of a group called the Brethren in Christ under Jacob Engel. And uh, some of Teresa's ancestors were very active in a group that broke off of the Brethren in Christ called the Old Order River Brethren. They broke off between 1843 and 1855. In Pennsylvania in 1800 saw Martin Bain and William Otterbein form the Church of the United Brethren in Christ. And if we would leave Pennsylvania and go to the United Kingdom in 1828, we find a former Anglican priest by the name of John Darby who founded the Plymouth Brethren or sometimes they're called the Christian Brethren. And leaving England and Ireland, we could go to Russia in 1860 and find under Abraham Cornelson the beginning of the Mennonite Brethren. Yes, there is a Mennonite denomination called Mennonite Brethren. And then finally, go back to 1708, the Church of the Brethren. There were eight individuals that met together. They had Bible studies. After they studied the Bible, considering it as the Word of God, Alexander Mack and seven other pious souls were baptized in the Ader River. Unfortunately, the brethren have splintered and divided many times into other groups. When they came to America, there was a division in 1728 called the Seventh Day German Baptist Brethren. And I might say that. When Teresa and I pastored in Waynesboro, near Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, in Roserville, um, the Seventh Day German Baptist Brethren, uh, they had two different congregations. One of their congregations, they could not find a, a pastor or somebody to preach. So on Saturdays, I would preach at the Seventh Day German Baptist Brethren, and then on Sundays, I would preach at the Roserville Church of the Brethren. I remember one time we even had a joint love feast together. And when people would request outdoor baptisms, they had a wonderful place, the Seventh Day German Baptist Brethren, where we could baptize in a stream. Well, back in 1881, the old German Baptist Brethren broke away from the Church of the Brethren. And in recent years, there's been a division among the old German Baptist Brethren. They have what they call the Old Conference and the New Conference. Some people say the division was over the issue of can you use the internet or not. Other people say there are other issues. The Brother Church Ashland, Ohio was organized in 1883, the Dunkard Brother in 1926, the Grace Brother in 1939, and then the Grace Brother had another division. And that in 1992, you had the Conservative Grace Brother. And of course, over the years, there have been brethren congregations who have become independent brethren or Bible brethren. And this year, the year 2020, we have the development of the Covenant Brethren Church. Their bylaws have been prepared. Now, it's interesting. All of these groups continue to want to use the word brethren, right? And they have become separate, distinct identities within the larger church of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, I think there's a lot of different reasons. Sometimes there are issues of control. Sometimes there are issues of having an emphasis on distinct doctrines or practices. Sometimes these different brother groups, if you'd examine them carefully, they all have different boundaries of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. I know as a my last church that I pastored in the state of Maryland, I'd often have people who didn't know much about the Brethren. They would come to me and they would say, well, there's the Church of the Brethren, there's Grace Brethren, and there's German Baptists. What, what's the difference? 
And I would tell them by way of illustration, well, you know, there's different sizes of umbrellas, right? Some umbrellas have room just for one person. Other umbrellas are a little bit larger. And certainly in the Church of the Brethren, we have a rather large umbrella. There's a big diversity of not just doctrine, but also practice. Now, our scripture lesson that Jeanette read for us takes us back again geographically to the Holy Land of the first century. And there Jesus was calling out a distinct type of people, individuals who would desire to adhere to a new and a distinctive way of life and of thought. People that would be sensitive and responsive to light, to sound, and willing to take determined action as they followed the principles of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. If you look again in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8, verses 16 to 18, we can see Jesus presented to the brethren, right? The parable of a lighted lamp or candle. But what was this significance? We know in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, the declaration that God is light. Certainly God created light. God gave light its properties. Light travels 186,000 miles per second. And unfortunately, the ancient pagans chose to worship the light instead of the creator himself. Now in New Testament times, you have to understand that an oil lamp was a very common household item. The lampstand was normally a niche built into a wall, and it was customary to burn this lamp overnight to counteract the dread of natural darkness or to deter prowlers. You might consider this lamp that Jesus was using in his illustration comparable to a modern nightlight. Some of you might know we have a small uh, cabin by my son's property. And sometimes one of our granddaughters will have her friends come over and they'll have a sleepover in this cabin. And uh, I guess it was about a week or two ago, I, I went down because I had some sort of some lights in the cabin that were powdered by batteries. And when I switched the lights on, guess what? No light. And I found out that these little girls, they wanted to have these lights on all night as their nightlight, just like these lamps would burn in New Testament times. Now another way of looking at the oil lamp in the New Testament is not only was it a night light, but it was sort of an early version of a home security system that some of you might have. Now, what is the point Jesus was trying to make? It would have been utterly ridiculous to attempt to hide this light. The light that Jesus was speaking about, of course, was symbolic of the spiritual light that Jesus thought that his brethren would logically want to share and to shine to other individuals. Authentic brethren would not want to hide the spiritual illumination received through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Authentic brethren would willingly display the light of his holiness and purity and the light of their own personal holiness and purity. Authentic brethren would want to radiate spiritual joy. Authentic brethren would always acknowledge Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Authentic brethren would daily acknowledge, not just on Sunday morning, but daily acknowledge the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and the light of God's word as essential for a successful Christian walk in a sin-darkened world. Now, this parable also explains why a lamp's light must never be hidden. You see, living biblical truths could be compared to a light bulb's light. For example, some of you in your homes may have a closet with a light inside the closet, right? Okay. Now, if you close that door and leave that light on, 
that light in the closet isn't benefiting anyone except maybe the ants yeah. that Teresa talked about, right? right? But how often, I want you to think about this parable of the lamp, the light. How often do we put our Christian light and our Christian testimony in a closet? Do we find it convenient to only put on our spiritual clothing, our spiritual light for special occasions? You see, in this parable, Jesus was also exposing contemporary Jewish theological errors. Because at the time Jesus was living, many Jews believed secret adultery was fine. You know, archaeologists have found, as they keep excavating the homes of Jewish people, they found not only symbols of Jewish worship, but they're finding idols in these same homes. How many secret idols do we place in our lives before our daily commitment to Jesus Christ? Other Jews believed if a person only sinned in private, the name of the Lord was not profaned. And I wonder, do we sometimes, like many first century Jews, make a distinction in our lives between our private and our public moral behavior. I believe the point Jesus was trying to make here in his teachings, in his parable, is that authentic brethren will show their spiritual light not just in their private lives, not just on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, but in their public 24-7 lives as well. The second point, that Jesus was making in this parable was the importance of hearing for authentic brother. And he expressed this in Luke chapter 8, verse 18, and Luke chapter 8, verse 21. You know, it seems that the quality of our hearing or our listening is extremely important. Some of you remember Ford Motor Company used to have an ad on television and it sort of went like this, as there was this hand, uh, what would we say, polishing the Ford emblem, quality, job one. And I think our hearing, our listening, needs to be quality, job one. Now, I know all of you are hearing my voice this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary or if you're watching via the internet, but you're not all listening. There's a difference between hearing and listening. And have you ever considered that the listener has as much to do to promote the effectiveness with a message as a preacher or as a teacher? In my training as an educator, it encouraged me in the classroom to emphasize listening skills as much as reading, speaking, and writing skills. You know, each one of us we have two means of input and we have two means of output. Our input is what we hear or listen or what we see and read. And then our output, of course, can be speaking or writing or, or word processing. You know, it was Jesus' intention that authentic brethren listen to the content that he, as the light of the world, was teaching them. A third point, authentic brethren are devoted to determined action. Authentic brethren can respond to the light that God has given them and act upon hearing the word of God. You know, one of my favorite books of the Bible is the book of Acts. It's the story of the growth of the early church. And in the book of Acts, you'll find more references to the term brethren than any other book of the New Testament. In fact, you'll find the word brethren 53 times in the book of Acts. Today, if we wanted to visit the country of the world that has more brethren than any other country, we would have to visit the country of Nigeria. Some of you remember two years ago, there was a Brother World Conference in Winona Lake, Indiana, and we had a special worship service as a part of that conference at this church. I know some of you know Musa Mabula, 
who is presently pastor of the Walker Church of the Brethren. And I remember when I attended one day of that Brother World Conference, and that was the first time I met Musa. Musa said before the attacks of Boko Haram in Nigeria, there were nearly two million brethren worshiping in Nigeria. Hundred years ago, you know how many brethren were worshiping in Nigeria? This many. But American missionaries took the word of God and the Nigerians didn't just hear it, they listened to it. And today, we need to pray daily for our Nigerian brothers and sisters, the brethren there. Did some of you hear this week that five international Christian aid workers were executed by Boko Haram in Nigeria? Two years ago, Musa said an estimated 13,000 brethren had been killed. And of course, the killings, the church burnings, the abductions, the beheadings, they continue. Why do you suppose in Luke chapter 8, verse 20, the mother and the brother of Jesus' family wanted to see him? Why at this particular time did they want to see Jesus? Was it because of the opposition of the Pharisees to Jesus' teaching? Was Jesus' family begin to fear for his physical safety, just like brothers and sisters going to church in Nigeria today would? Or were they beginning to have an authentic concern for the spiritual teachings of Jesus Christ? Some people look at chapter 8 of Luke and verse 21, and they think, ah, Jesus is being nasty here. He's not honoring his earthly mother and his family. But I believe the point Jesus is trying to make here is that a personal spiritual relationship with him and his spiritual brothers and sisters was higher, was stronger, and was more important than any shared biological relationship. I do not believe Jesus was in any way condemning his mother and his brethren, but he was putting God the Father and his spiritual brethren first. Jesus that day wanted to make clear to the crowd who the authentic brethren really were. Authentic brethren would hear the word of God, and with the power and inward light of the Holy Spirit, allow the word of God to change their lifestyles. Unfortunately, we live in a time when not only Christians, but non-Christians are attempting to limit the power of God's word. It was interesting, I came across, and this was just last night, uh, in 2014, there was a special study center at Indiana University and Purdue University that studied what version of the Bible do people read. It's interesting that those secular universities would be interested in conducting this study. And they found that people who not have a Bible, but people who read a Bible, this is the Bible that is read. 55% of the American people who read a Bible read the King James Version. Now, I know some of you are looking at me and your eyes are getting open and you're saying, well, that's too hard for me to understand. I recall when I was a Christian bookstore manager, we would have usually one or two managers meetings a year. We would have different Bible publishers come in. And uh, one of the Bible publishers came in one year with readability studies of the different Bible versions. The readability of the King James Version is a 12th grade level. The second Bible that is most read in the United States is the New International Version. And I know that's the version that Pastor Stan and I usually preach from, but today I'm using King James Version to some extent. 19% of people who read the Bible read the NIV. That comes in at number two. Now, number three is the New Revised Standard Version. 
Only 7% of Bible readers read the NRSV. And a number of years ago, when, uh, see, I think it was the Jubilee, I don't remember exactly which Sunday school curriculum it was, a brother press from Elgin, Illinois, asked for some feedback because they were changing which scripture version they were going to use. And they decided to drop the New International Version in favor of the NRSV. Why would you choose for Sunday school literature to put in a Bible version that only 7% of Bible readers read? And of course, uh, I'll let you draw your own conclusions on that. 6% of Bible readers read the New American Bible. And that is one of the approved Roman Catholic translations. I know I've seen many people still read the Living Bible. The Living Bible, 5% of Bible readers read the Living Bible. And all the other various useful translations that we have would total 8%. Now, I guess because I've taught English and I continue to teach English part-time as a new language. Sometimes I get a little bit sensitive about proper nouns and common nouns, especially when I'm teaching students whose first language is usually Spanish, but I teach people whose first language is Japanese sometimes, and sometimes it's French, I mean, different languages. But you know, different languages have different rules about what is a proper noun, what is a common noun. Okay? And if you consult dictionaries that have been used for decades and decades, the word Bible is a proper noun with a capital B. Biblical, the adjective, is also considered a proper adjective with a capital B. And scripture is considered to be a proper noun with a capital S. But I find in many writings today, people are not capitalizing B for biblical, sometimes not even B for Bible, and seldom do you see capital S with scripture. Now, how about the world that we're living in today? Um, I think most of us are aware there have been uh, demonstrations, protests, they're called by a variety of names, in Portland, Oregon. And uh, recently, American flags have been burned in Portland, Oregon. And our Supreme Court ruled years ago, it's legal, free speech, you can burn the American flag. And I checked this out on several different sources. On Friday, they began to burn Bibles in Portland, Oregon, right beside burning American flag. When I think about burning books, I think about Nazi Germany. But can you believe they are now burning Bibles in public in Portland, Oregon? What does that say? about the mindset, the worldview, the values of somebody, and I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, that would burn this book. We need to be praying for revival, praying for change. You know, dozens of creeds have been established over the centuries. The Apostles' Creed, there's the Nicene Creed. But one thing that all of the brethren who have been spiritual descendants of Alexander Max since 1708 have believed we should never have a man made creed. Instead, the creed of all these different brethren groups has been the Bible, a divine creed. I'm sure most of you in American history learned about Benjamin Franklin. 
And in our secular history books, you know, they talk about, you know, lightning and Benjamin Franklin at the Declaration of Independence Convention, Constitutional Convention and all this. But Benjamin Franklin, he knew the brother. I'd like you to listen to Benjamin Franklin's reaction to an interview of Michael Wolfhart, who was a leader of a colonial brother congregation at Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And these are the words of Benjamin Franklin. Michael Wolfhart complained to me that they were grievously culminated by the zealots of other persuasions and charged with abominable principles and practices to which they were under strangers. I told him this had always been the case with a new denominations and that to put a stop to such abuse, I imagine it might be well to publish the articles of their belief and the rules of their discipline. He said it had been proposed among them, but not agreed to for this reason. Quote, when we were first drawn together as a society, said he, quote, it had pleased God to enlighten our minds so far as to see that some doctrines which were esteemed truths were errors and that others which we had esteemed errors were real truths. From time to time, he has been pleased to afford us further light. Our principles have been improving and our errors diminishing. Now, we are not sure that we have arrived at the end of this progression and at the perfection of spiritual or theological knowledge. And we fear that if we should once print our confession of faith, we should feel ourselves bound and confined by it and perhaps unwilling to receive further improvement and our successors still more so as conceiving what their elders and founders had done to something never to be departed from, unquote. Now, what did Benjamin Franklin think about this? He went on to write this tribute about the brethren at Ephrata. Quote, this modesty in a denomination is perhaps a single instance in the history of mankind. Every other denomination supposing itself in possession of all truth and that those who differ are so far in the wrong like a man traveling in foggy weather. Those at some distance before him on the road he sees wrapped up in the fog, as well as those behind him, and also the people in the fields on each side. But near him all appears clear, though in truth he is as much in the fog as any of them. Wow. According to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, we are not to live in the fog. The Bible says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Sisters and brothers, are we walking every day in the light of God's word? How strong are our spiritual, interpersonal relationships? We know earlier in this chapter, in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 to 15, Jesus shared the parable of the sower and the soil. And in this parable, too, Jesus mentioned other attributes, I believe, that can be characteristic of authentic brethren. Their roots are firmly planted in the Lord Jesus Christ. They try to obey the whole entire word of God. They witness, they share with others the complete life-changing truth of the gospel. Authentic brethren possess honest and good hearts they are shining lights. Authentic brethren retain the word of God when they listen to it. Authentic brethren patiently perform God's plan for their lives. And authentic brethren see spiritual fruit. By God's grace, 
May all of us patiently perform as authentic brethren as we follow God's will in our lives and yield spiritual fruit. May God's grace, may none of us ever be known as pseudo-brethren, but may each of us be found as authentic, real, and genuine brother. I encourage us to stand as we're able at this time. In the hymn book, it's number 586, Trust and Obey, and the words will be on the screen as we reflect on God's word. says that we can give them a reason for the hope that is within us. I pray for each one of us to be authentic brethren, bearing the light of the word of God to the darkness 
that has befallen not just our nation, but so any, many other nations. So help us to be faithful, to be genuine, to be honest, to be encouragers. We ask that you might help us through the Holy Spirit and through our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.